Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. A special hello to my listening audience that has really been growing all over the world. Thanks for joining us. What does food mean to you? The intense heat makes for the perfect way to enjoy the end of the summer and squeeze every last drop out, but my favorite way to fend off the summer temperatures is with an authentic granita. I got used to this cool, refreshing treat to deal with the extreme heat while living in Italy. You can buy a granita in many flavors at almost any coffee bar. Granita has somewhat of a cult following in Sicily, and you can tour the beautiful island and be sure that almost anywhere you go, you can refresh with a chilled granita. Here are some of my favorite stops, besides the beaches, art, and ruins of Sicily. Now, I know most of us can't travel to Sicily yet, and I visited these places before the pandemic, so not sure if they are still there, but a trip to any coffee bar in Sicily right now, even if only in our minds, is worth the memory. So here goes. In Palermo, get thee to Al Pinguino at Via Ruggiero Settimo 86, where the Granita is crystal-like. The Granitas are seasonal, in summer, it's best to try the black fay granita, and in winter, the blood orange granita. In Taramina, the beaches are splendid, but the granita is oh so heavenly. I stopped at Gelato Mania on Corso Umberto 7 to satisfy the chocoholic in me. Their granita alla Nutella and granita with white chocolate and hazelnut are the ultimate. When you arrive on the charming island of Stromboli, stop at Retrovo Ingrid in Piazza San Vicenzo to enjoy a fig granita. While discovering this retro stop made famous by the black and white film with the iconic award-winning actor Ingrid Bergman. And if you can't get to Sicily or the island of Stromboli, no worries, your kitchen will suffice for a substitute staycation. Make your own homemade granita, and although the only ingredients are espresso, water, and sugar, the real granita artisans will tell you that the outcome of your granita heavily depends on the quality of water and coffee used. So plain old tap water will just not do. Use a good quality water and also an organic coffee. Here's my recipe for a homemade coffee granita. Four cups of water, one cup of dark espresso coffee one to two cups of granulated sugar or stevia. Stir together all the ingredients in a large shallow pan. Place in the freezer and cover with plastic wrap. After one hour, use a fork to break up any ice that has formed. Recover with plastic wrap and then you need to repeat this four more times every hour. Serve topped with whipped cream or a vegetarian whipped cream made from coconut milk, almond milk, or oat milk. Makes it even better. Enjoy! I am really excited that we have a special guest, Marianne Rodini Spencer, who is not only a best selling author, is a screenwriter and producer also. Marianne, thank you so much for sharing all of these wonderful stories I know you're going to share with us with my listening audience. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's great. Thank you so much for having me. And you are in California, right? You're on the West Coast. I am. So, Marianne, tell us, how did your journey into writing start? You know, I love to write growing up. I would write stories um, from an early age when I could. I wanted to be working on the school newspapers, and I did, although I really didn't pursue it uh, until much later. I, When I was growing up, I really worked in the theater. I loved working behind the scenes. I, I was an acting apprentice, but I also worked on props and costumes. And that was something that my mom got me interested in because I was bored during the summers. I was too young to work. 
-hmm. And they had a wonderful theater group at the junior high and high school. And I did that all through junior high and high school and pursued it uh, for two years after that while I in the summers during college. And then I changed my major. I started getting very curious about how productions were mounted. So I became a film and television major, and I loved it. I just loved it. And I was doing a little bit of writing then, but mostly producing, directing, putting together projects. But I always kept my hand in writing. And when I moved to California after graduation, I became a writer-producer. I had to take a writing test. I remember that. For Cable News Network, and I was hired, and I was a writer-producer. And during that time, one of my associates was doing a lot of magazine writing, and we started doing articles together. And then that led me to do more magazine writing and production. And I knew at some point I wanted to write a book. That was a dream of mine, to always write a novel. And I, I also wanted to do cookbooks. And, but again, it took, it was a progression. And I think I was very busy, you know, working, making a living. I was writing every day as a producer. And then when I went into public relations, I used my writing there too. And then it was, it, when I started really figuring out Hollywood and how am I going to make movies? That was my goal when I was a kid. And I'm like, okay, so I'm here in Hollywood. Now, how do people really do it? <laughs> it was a process to learn and see see because each person has their own story but mine was learning that I had to find a property and create a script from that property or create an original script so that's I started um, doing that kind of work um, besides my tv writing for a, a, a series or a show I knew that that was the step to getting a movie made or my own screenplay done but I had produced quite a lot of other movies and helped put together productions for a number of other studios before I actually said to myself, okay, enough's enough. I'm tired of doing everyone else's movie. I want to do my own stories. And um, a friend offered me a book. She said, Marianne, I know you're going to love this book. And it was a uh, James Michael Pratt book, The Lost Valentine. Oh, okay. And so I read it and I, I said, James, I love this story. I want to write it as a screenplay. Let's do it. So we did our deal, and um, the rest is history because yes. it became a movie with Betty White for Hallmark Hall of Fame. Yes, yes. So tell us, that was leading to my next question. <laughs> so what any, you know, what was it like to work on that project, and what have you learned through that process? I learned that it takes a village, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you why. Because I, while I wrote the script, um, and I have a production company, I formed – associations with other people we were we were pitching different projects together because sometimes different people have different contacts and you really have to use those contacts out of my public relations work I had met someone Hollywood event and I said I heard overheard him say we want family entertainment so I said you know I'm working on a script right now I'd love to pitch it when I'm done can I do that he said sure send it along so it kind of led to that and then working in association with that group we pitched it to Hallmark Hall of Fame, and, and they had a deal with CBS at the time. But it took a while. Uh, we did our deal. It took about two or three years before they actually produced it into a wow. movie. Sometimes it takes a long time yes. to make a project. So you have to work on multiple projects because you never know which one is going to go. And, I, you know, it's funny. I mean, you probably know this, too. I know people think things just happen quickly you know yeah. they don't realize you have to be very patient and you know wait just like you said it, it took a few years and I've heard of things taking five years ten years even reading something and I do believe it was for Forrest Gump the uh -huh. producer did an interview and she said it usually takes 10 or 11 years mm-hmm Yes, I've, I've heard that also. Yes. So um, things are slow moving, but if you're patient, it's worth it. Well worth it, I guess. Yes. <laughs> you come up with it. Sometimes it can happen faster. It just, you know, it really just depends. And I think now there's so many avenues um, between the internet, um, smart TVs, Hulu, Netflix. Yes you know, the networks, um, there's so many ways a project can be mounted and shown, uh, mm -hmm. but, and each one might have a certain particular medium. I think the, the great part is if you're creative, you figure out 
what you, the story you want to tell, where it will work best. And you do work on lots of projects at the same time. Like I have probably eight completed scripts for different types of projects. And I am doing several projects now and p- besides my books. Right. Yes. Wow. So, yes, you have to keep your hands kind of working on many things at yes. one time. Yes. I think that's really important for people to know also that want to get into, um, um, I was going to ask you this and I didn't realize you were from the East coast also. So now I know from our conversation before this recording, but I'm from the East coast also. So, um, and I, you know, I know you're from the East coast. So what is it like working and living between California and Hawaii? And I have to say, I'm always on the East coast. I go back oh. quite, because I still have family there. Yes. But I love being able to go to different locations. Um, uh-huh. I love being, of course, visiting my family back East and having them come visit me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love living in California because of not only the work, and I moved here because of specifically because of work, beautiful climates. You have the mountains, the ocean, the desert, and you can be in all three places within a few hours. Oh, so wow. I can literally be in the desert and go to the mountains, and then I can go to the beach. Wow. <laughs> Awesome. And the weather's great. Hawaii is just a love of mine. Um, if you're living in California, it's maybe five hour by mm-hmm. five hours by plane. Mm-hmm. And it's so gorgeous. I, I started going to Hawaii maybe the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. And I just fell in love with it. I, I think the first island I went to was Maui and I cried when I left. <laughs> <laughs> I just got that aloha spirit into me. I I didn't necessarily know when I first went there that I'd be writing about Hawaii in in the Kate Grace mystery series, but it's just the perfect place for my books. Yes, it's it sounds like it sounds like a just amazing, amazing place. Um, and that you can find really interesting little little spots that are very inspirational. So what are the some of the differences? I know you have a and and you're going to tell us about it, too, but a background in the culinary arts and writing. And um, what are some of the differences in the way people consider Italian cooking, like in California and Hawaii? Because I know the East Coast, like we're really populated, especially mm-hmm. like we were talking about Boston and, you know, New York, Philly. Lots of very concentrated places where you can find Italian cooking, but uh-huh. Hawaii, well, do they have everything you could ever want in Hawaii? <laughs> um, they, they might do a little bit of a different twist. You know, there are Italian restaurants. I've been to Italian restaurants on the islands. Yes. But they also do something kind of like in California where it's fresh, farm um, table fresh. Yes, yes. Fresh fresh catch grilled or, you know, um, done a little bit differently. A lot of mahi and mahi mahi and pokey, you know, they have a lot of uh, fish, obviously. But what I love about it is um, in Hawaii, the soil is so rich because of the lava and um, just the the new soil. It's just fabulous. And the vegetables, the fresh vegetables at the farmer's markets, or Mm -hmm. if you're going to a restaurant and have the garden fresh heirloom tomatoes and things like that. It's just so delicious. Has a wow. fat taste. And we have a lot of that in California too. I live in Ventura County, California, mm-hmm. which is I think it's the tenth largest agricultural center in the United States. We have lots of farms. Wow. And you can go to the farms or you can go to the uh, farmers markets. And yes. I think Many states have that, and I, I really say that if you live near, just investigate, Google where you live, go to a mm-hmm. farm market. You get fabulous deals. You get to know who's growing your food. Mm-hmm. They give you recipe tips. But I kind of got into all this because I always wanted to write a cookbook. I did a, I did produced a lot of cooking shows when I worked at CNN or segments. And I also was a life, I am a lifestyle writer. For many years, I wrote a lot of lifestyle pieces and food pieces. I was a food editor for Palm Springs Life mm-hmm. uh, and wrote for them for many years on lifestyle and, and culinary. I love it. It's something that I, I, I love it because I grew up in a big Italian Irish family. We love to entertain. Mm-hmm. I collect recipes. I help my mom and my grandma. And um, those are some of the things I also bring into the Kate Grace Mysteries because it's all about, in my family, it was all about food and connection. 
Mm-hmm. And I think that, especially now with what's going on with the COVID pandemic, yeah. I that making the most of a meal with the family that you, you can see or that you're with is vital. You know, even if you do it through Zoom, if you have to do it through Zoom. But I think connections are really so important and we really have to nurture them. And I love that about Hawaii, which is why Lady in the Window is the first book in the Kate Gray series. Why I wanted to place it there because they're very big on family. Mm-hmm. Ohana which is your immediate family, your friends, also where you work, your community, and they love to entertain. Food and entertain together is like a big thing. Wow. So that, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. I mean, I knew in Hawaii, I assume they did have Italian food, but what I, I guess I, what I was trying to also come up with is, you know, how that the culture there could be fused with Italian, you know, the Italian culture, Italian cooking. So it sounds like it's similar in that way, you know, that it's family. It, it, it sounds like they encourage yeah. Family, right. very, very family oriented, very, they even have something called an ohana, which wow. is many homes have an ohana. And what that is, is where your extended family, they either live or come to stay for a while. It's, wow. a, it's like a guest house, but most houses have an ohana. Oh, wow. That's really very, very interesting. Definitely. You've developed recipes for some companies, right? For many companies. Any any favorites that stick out, like any recipes that... Uh... Well, you know, I have a, um, on my website, alohawriter.com, I use. Um, okay. and you People also can go to my name. I have a blog and I, 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 where I have these recipes and over the time, it's developed a little bit differently, but I've worked with Jarlsberg, Woolrich Dairy, Benito's, Garlic Gold. I've created recipes specifically for them. Uh-huh. Um, and it could be like with Garlic Gold, I, I've created some fun salad recipes with lots of fresh, crunchy vegetables. Uh-huh. Benito's, I did a, a chunky guacamole mm-hmm. with like chunks of tomato um an onion in there it's yummy Ooh, that um, sound good. i just you know i kind of just have fun create mm-hmm. i always created recipes growing up and sometimes i'll i'll go out to dinner or i'll read something in a magazine i'll go hmm i wonder if i tried this ingredient and put that ingredient and you know i i i just love creating recipes i don't know why it's well uh-huh. it's creative thing and it's very different than sitting at my computer yes yes and it's fun I it's probably fun because you grew up doing it and it, it just you know when you were cooking right you were around family and friends and so right it's inspiring <laughs> a, a feel good um it's a just generates a feel good for me and I love that that you said it's fun because I always tell people sometimes I think people take it too serious, you know, and putting ingredients together. And I always say, look, you know, you you got to just have fun with it, also, right? So do, and you have to taste while you go along. Yes. And you know, if a, a recipe has too many ingredients or is too complicated, I will be the first to say I'm turning the page. Yes. <laughs> I like it simple, that tastes good, that is really clean, um, that tastes delicious using lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. And over time, I've even gotten away from using granulated sugars. I I use um, fresh fruit puree substitutes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I do a lot of vegetarian, a vegan. Uh uh, But, you know, I have recipes that you can add fish or meat to or choose your protein. Uh So, um, you know, I, I really changed my style a little bit but uh-huh. it's it's all i i like to taste i like to know what i'm eating i'm eating a string bean i want to make sure i know what it's oh <laughs> yes that's really important and that actually leads to my other question i love this title the title of your pbs series simply delicious living tell us a little bit about that um and i think what you just said probably relates to that show but yes. a little bit about that show Yes, I really, I started doing that in 2010. I had, I was in Ventura County Star, vcstar.com with video 
and print column, uh, Simply Delicious Living. And it was also on Time Warner Cable for a while. Uh-huh. Now it's on PBS in Southern California. And people can watch it on my blog, but they can, I have a YouTube channel as well. You could watch on your smart TV from anywhere. Uh-huh. Um, but basically it's a how to, you know, I do simple little, uh, recipes that taste delicious, fresh and natural ingredients. It's all about that. My blog gets more into, Simply delicious living, meaning you create your recipe, whether it's food, exercise, what you're thinking. Um, I give examples of how to live sustainably, ideas for making, you know, a joyous connection in life. So the blog gets into a lot more uh, in addition to the recipes on screen on PBS. It's strictly me create, you know, talking about a recipe and sharing it. Uh-huh. And, uh, and then people can go to the website and print out the recipe. But I love doing that. And um, I, I just... It's again, it's part of who I am. It's I'm I'm just driven to do it. I don't even know why. I was going to say it sounds like it's part of you. So that's that's yeah. great because, yeah. you know, it's what you live and breathe. Your you know your show. It sounds like correct because you know it's funny. Um, I am so happy just writing my books or screenplays mm-hmm. and it being in the kitchen cooking, creating recipes, doing my cookbooks. Um, if I just do that, those things for the rest of my life, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. I could I definitely relate to that. Yeah. So I know we're talking about happy and food is fun and all that, but um, how has the pandemic affected your work? Do you have any tips for my listeners on staying productive for people yeah. working from home? I do. And I want to say, first of all, that, um, and this comes from doing a lot of books that take place in Hawaii and going to Hawaii, but aloha, you know, people know it to mean hello, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also something called living in the spirit or the way of aloha, which Uh is how you interact with the natural world. So it's, it, it includes like the thoughtful and deliberate preservation of the earth being kind to people, have being tolerant, compassionate, treating others with respect, like the golden rule, how you would want to be treated. And I think that um, that's a tip I always give for Simply Delicious Living, because I think when you are good and respectful to other people, you know, it just uplifts everybody and then it comes back to you. I really believe that if you try to understand a person and where they're coming from and you you talk respectfully, you'll see a whole different way of interacting. Mm-hmm. And um, so that is part of it. And I think in this pandemic, we have to be respectful of one another. Um, I think there's a lot of violence that's going on to get a point across. I do believe there's other ways you can get your point across, other con- very constructive ways mm-hmm. um, to get your point across. One um thing that I experienced was online um, at one of our city governments had a public forum that people could join in and listen and write their comments. And they wanted to hear the the opinions. Mm -hmm. Um, So rather than being a violent thing where things are destroyed, Mm -hmm. you know, be constructive and work in a way where you could work with other people. Eat healthy exercise because you have to take care of your immune system. And what does that when you eat healthy? fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, uh, it's very simple. Um, Even the, you know, there's guidelines what you should be eating every day. And I think if you keep it fresh and natural, if you, if you get a box or a can and which I highly say, try not to eat fresh, but if if you don't know what the ingredient means that you're reading, that's a primary ingredient and what you're eating, that's a danger. Yes. Yes. (laughs) And you know, with the pandemic, I think you'll agree If you have more time to stay at home, you'll have more time to spend on exercising and kind of taking care of yourself. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people are doing that during this time period. And if you can't go to the gym, you know, you could walk in a park around your neighborhood. Um, You can there you can buy leg weights. Um, there are things that you do. I think you have to definitely take care of your body and, and yourself and also your mind. You have to surround yourself with prayer, um, affirmations of, you know, things, thinking positively, you know, um, giving gratitude every morning is a great way because it makes you mindful of your blessings. It's so easy to get depressed during this time period if you think about all the negative things. But if something's really a negative, 
try to get away from that. You know, it find out what's going on in the news. But, you know, if it's giving you anxiety, don't watch it all night. Exactly. And gratitude. I love that. I love that because I always say people don't realize, you know, gratitude. You, you should definitely think of that in the first thing in the morning. You should just be, you know, happy that you can eat and breathe and walk and, you know, sleep. And there are people that there are many things that people don't realize they can do, you know, that they should express gratitude for. And that will take away all that negativity. So I think gratitude yeah. is such such an important ingredient in living positively. So I definitely I like that. Um, people don't realize that. So, uh, Marianne, what are some of, tell us about, I know you have a lot of exciting projects coming up. So tell us some of your upcoming projects. Sure. Um, well, Secrets of Grace Manor is the third book in the Kate Grace Mystery Series, and that will be coming out towards the end of this year. Um, I also have a screenplay for Lady in the Window, so we're pitching that. Hopefully it will be in, uh, in movie form very soon. Um, Simply Delicious Living is still happening. It's on tel- <laughs> doing episodes every month and creating recipes. I'm working on a new cookbook. And, um, I, you know, th- that's really keeping me busy. And I do have another idea for another book that I'm going to be working on right after um, Secrets of Grace Man- uh, Manor wraps up. Uh-huh. So I'm always constantly working on my books and um, trying to get movies produced. Wow, that's definitely more than enough. So that's great. Uh, Marianne, my last question to you, because I ask all of my guests to answer this. What does food mean to you? The first thing that came to my mind is family. Food and family go hand in hand. And um, it's part of life. It's a wonderful way to connect. Um, It's for your body. Um, It keeps you healthy. Um, It's life. Great. That's great. And um, one other thing I want, um, I'm sure my listening audience is going to be very interested in looking up your blog and your TV show. So tell everybody where they can find you. Sure. The easiest way to get to me is going to alohawriter.com. Or they can just put my name in there, MarianneRadiniSpencer.com, or my blog, SimplyDeliciousLiving.com. It all goes to the same place. This was Marianne Radini Spencer, best-selling author, screenwriter, and producer, as my special guest today. Thank you so much, Marianne, for being with us. Oh, it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and listening to the Maria Liberati Show. If you try my Italian granita and want to show it off, take a picture and hashtag the Maria Liberati Show. Post the photo on social media. We'll be gathering pictures and posting on my website in the next few weeks. Thanks to my producer, Britton Roselle, and my guest, best-selling author, screenwriter, Marianne Radini Spencer. Go to my website, marialiberati.com, to keep up with my blog and the show and my book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. Push that button to like, share with your friends, join me on Twitter at Maria Liberati with a capital M, on Instagram at Maria Liberati and chef underscore Maria Liberati, on Facebook at Chef Maria Liberati, and on Pinterest at Maria Liberati. And this podcast is heard all over the world on Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Radio Republic, and more. What does food mean to you? Hashtag your answer with hashtag the Maria Liberati show in a recorded soundbite of 60 seconds or less or a social media post of 50 words or less. Post on social media or email to me at maria at marialiberati.com. If selected for an upcoming podcast segment, you'll receive an autographed copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. 
I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions or ideas for upcoming segments, email me directly at maria at marialiberati.com. Until next time, peace, love, and pasta.